So that fly does well when the trout are potentially more spooky. So low clear water. It would be a simple thing to take, if you felt so inclined, uh, you could take that fly, find it. You could go to, uh, this is um, ADOT orange. And if you just felt like you wanted it to be a little louder, get a little bit more attention, you could either just take the thread and that's going to give it a little bit more visibility. Or you could also go to something like a pink laser dub. I've heard pink works well for trout. That's the rumor on the street is pink is not a bad color. And you could take just a tiny bit, and I mean tiny, tiny. People very commonly overdo dubbing, and we might talk about that in a little bit. But you can see this is hardly a wisp. This is like, you know, um, if it's even visible, and that's probably more than I need. Um, if you're not sure about the amount of dubbing to use, take out what you think you need, take half of it away, and then what's left, take half of that away. It's incredibly common to way overdub anything, and you can always add more when you need it. You're pretty much, for many situations with dubbing, especially in this situation, what I'm going to show you now is just a little uh, dubbing collar. You want to think about it more like painting the thread than actually adding any real bulk. So I just added a tiny bit of dubbing, and we're just going to do a small hot spot. Now it's about two wraps, and you can see how much I have left. I'm going to try to just unweave that from the thread and get off as much of that as I can. There's a little bit left that's not going to want to I can trim. And then I can spin the rest of that on. Laser dub is nice because it, 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 it adheres really, really well to the thread. But there's a tiny little pink hot spot. And then I'll have just a little one, two of orange. So if you wanted your fly to get a touch more attention, maybe if it was like small stream, but maybe off color, then a uh, this version uh, with just a little, little tiny collar, little tiny fluorescent orange thread visible doesn't hurt. So yeah, you could take that, that kind of foundational fly and add some extra components to it very easily. Cool, good question, Josh. All right, so this is going to be another really simple fly, but we're going to talk about um, ostrich hurl um, and ways to make that more durable. Because again, it's tying a fly that looks really easy to tie a nice looking fly that's going to fall apart after a fish or two. So I also want to incorporate some techniques to make the fly more durable. So I'm just going to go back to my uh, black Vivas 16 up. Starting about an eye's width behind the eye of the hook. And for this, I'm going to take that same fine wire, and this is going to be the, the rib. And actually, we could do a couple different things with this, and I'll talk about both options. And I will let you decide what is more compelling to you. So I've got that fine wire. And I'm just going to tie it in at the front of the hook. I'm going to pull back a little bit so that I get it nice and suited where I want it. And we do need to bring the thread to the bend because we're going to be tying in the astral back there. So what I by tying in the wire at the front of the hook, now the body stays nice and uniform versus me tying in the wire at the bend of the hook, where it would be thicker here and then thinner at the, at the, the front end. Sorry, there we go. Okay, and here's another reason why I think it's nice to go to a fly shop when you can, or if you maybe have friends who have ostriches, which uh, sounds weird, but I did when I was a kid, so I still have a bunch of feathers from when I was like a teenager. But when we're talking about ostrich troll, we're either talking about 
ostrich hurl or ostrich hurl, right? And so it's important, one, that you know kind of like how massive are the, the fibers because this is like three or four times longer fibers than this ostrich hurl, which is probably more common. And so when you're, you know, getting into fly tang and you're reading about certain patterns and attributes of those, you know, having an understanding about the spectrum of what you might be working with makes a big difference because frankly, on this size 16 hook that I'm using, this is the same 9671. It's just a, you know, it's just a, just a nymph hook. This would be kind of absurd. It's just, it's really long. This is going to be a better fit for it. So just the consideration when you're getting materials to understand that, you know, it, you might have options as far as how big, small, whatever. And uh, there are differences, even in something like as simple as ostrich roll. So we're going to take one single fiber. And I'm going to polymer it. And I'm going to tie it in. I'm going to trim off just a little bit. I don't like using the tips very much because they're so fragile. I mean, the whole thing is fragile but it's so fragile. And I'm only gonna do a couple of wraps. So I'm not gonna put it up the whole hook shank because there's hardly anything there. So now for durability sake, you got a few different options. You could coat the body with um, super glue like I've shown you a couple of times now. That'd be, that'd be fine. Um, you could take the wire and the ostrich curl and weave them together like a chenille, wrap, wrap, wrap. Or you could do that same idea with the thread and then keep the wire as a, as a separate um, wrap, which is what I'm gonna do. So if you just wanted a durable fly, you could take the ostrich hurl and basically turn it into a chenille. So I'm gonna pull some more thread out and then just wrap the ostrich around the thread. So you're creating a chenille. And you can wrap these two together up the hook shank, which makes it far more durable. Making it more durable still is to then take that wire and lay that on top, which is what I'm going to do. Um, as you get down, you can kind of twist. And before I wrap this, I'm going to just take my fingers and just run it up and down to pull out any fibers that might be hung up in that. And now I can just take this. I'm a huge fan of rotary vices. I think the specific brand matters less than if it's easy to just spin, in situations like this, spin the hook versus wrapping because there's less chance of the thread breaking when I can just hold it still. And this also allows me to really see the fly or every angle. Question? Oh yeah. So Kirk asked if you could explain a little bit more what you mean by polymering for those people who aren't advanced. Sure. Thank you, Kirk. So polymering is simply pulling the fibers of the feather away from the stem. And so to give you a really clear example, I'll take one of these. Um, this isn't a great feather, but hold on one second. Okay. Um, I'll take this uh, CDL feather that I used for the tail on a previous nymph. So palmering is simply um, grabbing the tip of the feather and then pulling down and separating out all those fibers because any feather to one degree or another is going to be connected to the other fibers on it. So. So when you separate these fibers out, when you go to wrap the, the hackle or pull them off like I've been doing tonight, it just lets you, one, see them better. But also when you go to wrap it, they won't be stuck together as much. And if we, if we take a different feather, that's much more webby. So here's another, this is still a, a CDL feather, but this one is very webby. You can see when I, when I palmer it, even after that, a lot of these fibers are still all connected. And so this wouldn't make a great feather to wrap anyway because of that. But when you, if you were to wrap this, it would wrap better and allow the fibers to separate out better. 
So that's what polymering is. Done a lot for things like woolly buggers or other kinds of, you know, uh, streamers. Done less so for materials like peacock and ostrich. And so for this, I just built this body. Of yarn where you have a core and then spun fibers over it. So like, uh, I think I have like, here's some ultra chenille. And, you know, so when I say chenille, I mean any kind of material that has a core on the inside and then spun fibers around it. So this is a chenille and I just made this into a chenille by wrapping that ostrich around the thread. All right, so we got the body. I'm just going to do, I got a couple loose feathers. So before I do anything else, I want to kind of pull them back and then tie them down. So now I can take my wire and before I do that, I'm going to just do a quick half hitch. Oops. Usually I use a, a, a bobbin holder quite a bit so that when I do this counter wrapping, thread stays in place. But what I want to do is try and counter wrap this wire rib up the hook shank without getting too many of the ostrich fibers compressed. I'm going to, I'm going to lose some and uh, that's all right. Not perfect, but decent. Now pull that tight and put a couple more wraps down. Hold that in place. Don't need more than that. Trim. So that's one way to really make a very durable body. And I can also take uh, a dubbing brush. I want to be kind of careful, but I can use this to tease out more of those ostrich fibers and kind of unhook them if they got caught underneath the wire so that it ends up a little bit more uniform than it was before. If I just want a really durable fly, I would have made the chenille using the ostrich and the wire and not even worried about adding the separate wire as an afterthought. It doesn't, you know, again, it's like what's a preference, but this looks good and is going to last a long time. And we're going to finish this as a this is a starling and ostrich, which is one of my favorite summertime dry fly or wet flies. So single starling feather. I feel like this used to be really popular. I don't know if it's super popular anymore. But uh, he fishes starling. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was a very quick <laughs> yes from Josh that he fishes this fly. This is a fantastic little. Absolutely. Um, small stream fly, especially, but I mean, stream is kind of like killer. I'm a big fan of soft tackles. Great trailer, too. Great trailer, too, according to Josh. Thank you for that, Josh. Or dropper. Or dropper. I agree with all the above recommendations. So, again, I'm sorry, I was off camera there. Um, I'm taking this. I, I pulled off all the phyllotums, which are the really fluffy fibers at the base of the feather, and I'm just pinching the very tip and I'm palmering this feather out. Okay, just like I did with the, the, the part very, very similar cartridge, but it's kind of like black to a certain degree. Um, it depends too, starling is interesting because you know the winter plumage is so dramatically different compared to the summer plumage. So if you find a winter bird, it's really iridescent, really nice looking. And then the summertime, which is what this is, is just kind of, it's got a little iridescence, but it's mostly just black, which is again, still fine. Um, so Kirk just asked if you could explain a little more what you mean by palmering when you're sort of bringing the feather out, because I usually think of palmering as when I'm wrapping it. Okay. I thought that's the term that I use for palmering, is the actual wrapping of it. Interesting. But I think you're using it to describe when you are sort of preening the feather out to set stretch off the bar. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, when I think of palmering, I think of um, sort of the preening action and then just wrapping it when I'm actually the act of wrapping it with the hook. But maybe I'm using it wrong. That's what I've always known it as. Yeah, I don't know. That's why I was using it. Yeah. I thought palmering was when you're 
was the laughing part. So you're teasing out the feathers that sort of separate them and get them to stand out from the exactly the stem. Yep. So I'm kind of rushing through this, not rushing through it. I'm not going, I'm not going into detail as much simply because this fly primarily was meant to show you a little bit about working with ostrich techniques as so I've done my wraps, just enough thread. And one thing that helps me, in this case, the fibers are they're oriented correctly, but they just are a little bit more erratic. They're kind of pushing forward a little bit. So I want to make sure that when I tie this in, or when I tie this fly off, I should say, that I don't get my thread hung up within the fibers or end up getting the fibers hung up in the wraps. So it's a little bit of a trick, but I'm going to pull a little bit more uh, thread out of my bobbin. And when I do my, uh, my whip finish, I'm going to try to catch the thread with one finger. Uh, this is my ring finger. And then with my thumb and forefinger, kind of supporting the thread of my ring finger. And then I can pull back all those starling fibers. So that way I can make sure that when I do these half hitches or the whip finish, that I'm, I'm making sure to not get them hung up in my wraps. Does that make sense? I'll show you again. So I'm going to pull a little bit more. I need to have some more thread out to do this compared to if I were just to do a standard whip finish. But I'm going to get it set up and support with my ring finger the thread, which, which leaves me my thumb and forefinger to just pull back those tackle fibers. One, two, three. And that's all I need. Super fishy fly. I could have done the wax on this, but again, I'm. I'm purposely skipping some of the things that I've already, I don't want it to be too redundant. The, the key thing for this is um, separating the fibers from the ostrich hurl and either making a chenille out of the thread or the wire, doesn't matter. I like this because I like that touch of flash that you're gonna get from the wire. The wire becomes less visible if you make the chenille between the ostrich hurl and the, or, uh, yeah, the astral and the wire. So I like the contrast of the actual wire wraps, um, but making the chenille and just makes it more durable. And then that little trick of just kind of using your ring finger to support the thread while you have you, your thumb and forefinger to pull those fibers back. That way you can make sure that the head, nice, neat, clean. Cool? Cool. All right. Thank you to everybody who's asking questions. Um, I think. We're gonna do we do one more, and uh, okay, yeah. So we'll do one more kind of quick fly, um, and then uh, and then if you have other questions that haven't come up yet, definitely definitely feel free to ask them. Um, just to keep things simple, I'm gonna use the same size 16 jig hook. These I like. Um, there's a million jig hooks now. These seem strong enough to support a decent fish. These are the Fasnas. This is a 1X short. Um, it's a wider gap hook. And you know, some hooks, even really well-known companies, can't handle um, kind of proper. I shouldn't say proper. All fish are proper. Every single fish is amazing. Larger stature um, fish, and these can. And I'm going to go to my. 2.4 millimeter uh, gold tungsten bead. I like these, uh, I don't know what they're actually used for, beads or something maybe. Um, I'm not the most organized guy, but I try to keep things like beads pretty well organized. Plus it allows me to quickly see what I have, how many I have, and then the sizes. And so we're gonna thread this on. Okay. We'll start it off same way. So I don't know if we have anybody here who maybe wasn't present for the first nymph, but I'm just going to put a little 
base of thread down at the very front of the hook, trim that off. I'm going to whip finish that. One, two, cut. I just want to have a little surface to adhere this bead to. And I always make sure before I actually put the super glue on, which I'm going to do in a second, that there's a reasonable amount of room to kind of fit that up there. It's a bummer when the jig, when the hole in the jig, uh, or when the hole in the bead, sorry, is not quite big enough. And you put even one single uh, layer of thread on it and uh, it doesn't slide on properly. So I like to make sure before I do that, that there is enough clearance because we all know that you know, even if one bead in the bag looks fine, the next one might be drilled or countersunk just a little bit different and it won't work. So real quick, you mentioned you're using slotted beads. Some people might not know where they're supposed to orient that slot part to point oh. out where that is on the- Yeah, so, so Josh brought up a great point. So if you're not familiar with slotted beads or I wonder if I have something big enough, um, a big enough hook to showcase this. I didn't bring anything really big. Um, so I can try. So with a slotted bead, if you're not familiar, let's see if I can do this. Whoa. All right. You have, where is it? I'm trying to get it so you can see what I'm talking about. This is like a five and a half mil bead. I'm just trying to get it oriented. So you have just the hole. That's what goes on first. And then at the opposite end, you have rather than just like a counter sunk, which is where it's just a bigger opening, it's got an actual slot cut out. So it's a hole and then it's like drilled in further down. And I wish I had a big jig hook to illustrate what, what you want. And you'll you'll see it pretty quickly. Let me see. Oh my God. Sorry, Sorry. Guys, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, that's all right. Uh, I want to see, maybe this will work. Maybe it won't. I'm not sure. I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, will it fit over the bead? Let's see if I can do it quick. D barb on a non J hook. Let's see if Josh has asked me for the impossible. I don't know. All right, so this is just a streamer hook. This is not, a, this is not, like I said earlier, you can use a slotted bead on a non-jig hook. I'm just going to show you this, I'll slide that on. And uh, basically, if you have that slot, let's see if I can show you again. It's kind of, there you go, that's yeah, it. Good. Okay, so the point of that is let's say this was a jig hook. If it's oriented properly, what's going to end up happening is that bead is going to be able to sit oh, I'm off the screen, sorry, underneath. So if it were a standard, and it's not going to be super obvious with this particular fly um, or this particular hook, because it's not a jig hook, but it allows it to sit more underneath the hook. So that basically there's more, it, it kind of, fits the bend of the jig hook better and it sits lower on the hook compared to just a straight a straight bead. Yeah, so right now with the hook that you have in the vice, the slot yeah. is facing. The slot the is, the meat, right? yeah, um, yeah, can I explain this better? I, if I had like a- Just point to where the slot is on the hook. Oh yeah, like sorry, the slot's like here, like right down there. So it allows, so rather than sitting kind of horizontal, it can cant down. And so it sits more snug towards the hook high and it can kind of sit a little bit lower so that it's more likely to orient hook point up. That's one of the advantages of a jig hook in the first place is the fact that it generally speaking, not always generally speaking, does ride more hook point up. So it does a couple of things. The main thing is it, it hangs up less in weeds and rocks, anything in the bottom of the, stream it tends to hang up less on. So that's kind of the advantage of it. Plus they look cool, which is important. Confidence. Awesome. All right. Thank you. That was a crude uh, representation, but I, I hope I conveyed my point. Um, 
So we are gonna, so, so that uh, bead has had some time to, or the, the glue has had some time to dry. And we're gonna do a little Ferdigone. Josh is thrilled and that makes me happy. It's gonna be in some ways similar to the little uh, pheasant tail because we're gonna use the same CDL. And you can see, you know, frankly, the longer I fish, I feel like the fewer flies I fish and the simpler they get. I like tying really complex flies, but I think, I think I'm just supposed to, when it comes to fishing, a lot of times, not always, a lot of times flies are just a couple of few materials and that's it. So I'm treating the CDL the same way. I just trimmed off the butts. So that way there's just less bulk to tie in. I'm gonna spin it to the hook points down. I wanna kind of orient those fibers. It's only about four or five. Get them suited where I want. Soft loop, just get them tied in. I'll bring that back to the bend. All right, all right. Now, this is a paradigone. We're not gonna put any wire rib on here. We are gonna do a couple other things. And one is, uh, We'll talk a couple. We'll talk about a couple materials you can use for a body. Um, one of my favorites is uh, Crystal Flash. This is a black, uh, um, black and olive. It's like an olive pearl, and this is a pretty fantastic color for a Peridone body, and it gives it a bit of flash. Very easy to work with. A single piece of this will tie like half a dozen of these flies. If you want to be elegant, and usually paragons and elegant are not paired together, uh, you can use the stem of something like a peacock curl. And to do this, I don't know how well I, I'll see how well I can show this. I'll see how good I am. I'm gonna take this, and I showed you earlier after I kind of pulled those stems off or pulled those stems out, what I call palmering. I kind of was like picking out the fibers on one side. If you wanna just remove fibers, you can take an eraser. And I can't, I don't know if I can show you this on the screen, but uh, I'll show you the aftermath of it. So you can spend a ton of money buying quills for paradigons. And I have yet to figure out one um, really reasonable reason as to why you would ever do that. I don't understand why you would spend a lot of money on practically nothing. I guess that's sort of what fly tying is in some ways, as much as we all hate to admit it. But uh, you know, it's like, I don't know, if you can do something as simple as just erasing the fibers, and I'm literally, let me see if I can kind of hold this up and show you. So I just literally have a, a pad of paper, with my notes on it, and I'm just literally running the eraser in the opposite direction of the orientation of those fibers. So I just stripped off that, that stem and I'm left with all of the little beautiful, wonderful iridescent uh, fibers on my legal pad or on my pad. Um, and that's just a you know pretty clean stem. And this is this makes a nice looking body for a peridone. All right. You might have a couple more little errant ones left. You can kind of pull those off with your fingers pretty easily. But, you know, I was talking through that and that took me about, I don't know, 20 seconds. If I were doing that at home, it would take me half that time. And I'm just gonna trim and off. But there you go, that's a, that's, a, that's a peacock quill. And I can take this and I can tie it in. And again, just like on my previous fly, I'm gonna, do kind of a soft loop, but I want to make sure that it reaches behind the bead and that makes the body nice and neat. I, I don't like these flies when that's it, when I, when I can take the quill and just wrap it up. I like there to be some taper. Everything that lives has some kind of shape. It's not just like little nothingness. So to get a nice taper to a paradigone, what I like to do is I, I have you know once back, once forward, and then I can take my thread 
and I'm going to do even reps about three quarters of the way back, not all the way, and then bring those forward. And then I'm going to go back about halfway and then forward. Okay. That's just building a little bit of a taper as, as you bring, you know, just to make a look at nothing about this really is natural, but it's as natural as you can get a pair to go, I think. And then I can take my uh, nice peacock stem and I can just wrap this with the rotary feature. And this, so the reason that you might consider a peacock stem for this purpose is because it has a nice gradation between a sort of grayish olive and a black. So you end up with a body that has a sort of natural ribbing characteristic to it. I don't know how well the fish can see it. Probably not very well, although maybe we're not giving enough credit, but it looks fairly reasonably like the body of a mayfly nymph. And so that's why you might use this. You can use ostrich hurl in the exact same way. It doesn't have, it's, it's closer to just like a black. It doesn't have quite as much uh, shade gradation as a peacock. And you can also use hackle stems. You know, I could take, I'm not going to, but I could take the CDL fiber and strip all the fibers off and I can use this stem in the same way that I just did with this. Any feather you can do that with, as long as it's flexible enough to be able to wrap around a hook, you can do that. Um, yeah, your choice. All right, so I have a couple fibers left, not too much. So that's all I'm gonna do for the body of this fly. I'm gonna take my whip finisher. One, two. Oh, you know, that was one thing I wanted to show you and I was gonna show you in the previous fly and I forgot. I'm gonna coat this whole body in solar rays, but let's forget about that for a second. Uh, let's say that I just had this fly and it was the perfect body and the thread amount was perfect and one single wrap extra would ruin the fly. You know what happens sometimes. I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but you get to the point where you're like, this is perfect, but I gotta tie it off. And when I tie it off, it's gonna just make the head look way too bulky. One thing that you can do is utilize some technology and use something like a, a UV cure. And so if you really don't want to add any more bulk to a fly, you're like, this is perfect, but I got to make sure that I make it more durable. Then one thing you can consider doing is taking, this is a Solarez, uh, and this is their bone dry, which is, I don't think there's a better way to finish a fly on the entire planet than this particular product. It does not get better than this. This stuff is awesome. Um, you'll notice that I one thing about it that I hate is normally there's a little brush here, and it's stuff, and I use that too big, and it gets it's just. I like to just have a bodkin, and I can take uh, a little bit of the Solarez UV cure glue uh, on a bodkin, and I can run that on my thread like so. And if I don't want to any bulk, here's what I can do. I'm just going to wrap some thread wraps on it, like so. And I just did six wraps. One, two, three, four, five, six. Unwrap. And what I did was I left some solar res on the fly. So now when I hit it with light, that's going to cure it. That's what's so amazing about these UV glues. And I added no extra bulk. Does that make sense? So I added the thread with the UV on it, the glue, and then I unwrapped the exact same amount of wraps, but by doing so, I left some on there and that added no bulk to it. But so if you have a fly that maybe it's got a bead head on there and, and then maybe some partridge and you really wanna keep the connection between those two materials really tight, you don't wanna add too much bulk by putting whip finishes in, this is an awesome thing to do. So that was one thing I meant to do on the previous fly and I forgot. Really cool, especially for small flies. You just don't want to add bulk, which, and you don't want to gum up the fly with too much UV, right? Too much of that glue. And that's what we're going to do now because it's a peritone. So we'd never, you know, you finish a peritone with glue. That was just a uh, hypothetical situation. 
and now we're going to go back to the to the bone dry. I'll get it on my uh, bodkin, and I'm going to coat. And this, you know, so Peridone, I think it's like French for dog food, or maybe pellet is what it actually stands for. I don't know, something like that. And uh, we're just going to put a thin coat on there. I'm trying to try to blend you all, so I'll just kind of. You have to make sure that the UV blue you have works with the light that you have. I'm going to put a touch more on. I, I missed one single fiber. I guess that's one advantage of purchasing quills is you're guaranteed to not have a single fiber on there. Because one single fiber will make a touch of a difference on here, I suppose. Um, but these things drop like a rock, and that's what's great about them. You can fish a very tiny fly that has very little resistance in the water. So in places where you need to get a fly down quick, but you don't want a really big fly, this is a fantastic option, as inelegant as they are. OK. And then we can do a wing case. We cannot do a wing case. I'll do a wing case, and I'm going to use bone dry black. So this is, again, solar as doesn't show up great. There you go. This is the black version of bone dry. And a, a really easy way to kind of gum up the fly is if I want to put this wing case on and I do it up here, because then I can just bleed down. So rather, I'm going to come in here and add the wing case. This is just a little bit of black. It does very little functionally or aesthetically, I'll be totally honest, but it's just kind of a standard feature. So if you did want to incorporate this, uh, the best way to do it is having the fly sitting where the, the, the cure is not going to go up. So by doing it on the bottom, you're not threatening the fly with getting the black gummed up every which way on there. Cool? Cool. All right. Um, I just talked a lot. I want to make sure I hit a couple extra points. And then if you have questions, I want to make sure you ask. If there's flies that work really well for you, I really encourage you to add it write down because it's incredibly easy because I'm sure that we all know to remember what those are. Sometimes you just have that perfect fly and you tied like six of them and you fished and you kicked ass and you lost every single one of them and then you're like what was that fly? It's really worth just taking a minute to write down the basics of what that fly was if you're making a variation and adaptation to a fly or just coming up with your own version of, of whatever it might be. I think it goes a, a long way. I've done a lot of commercial tying and I have just notes upon notes upon notes of things that I've done like custom orders for people and they email me a year later and they're like I want this fly and if I didn't have notes there'd be no way I could get it back to them. So I think that's important. Um, I think it's like I said earlier important to try whenever possible as hard as it is to purchase things in store and you know here's one example as to why. So you can order stuff on online and what might end up happening, and maybe some of you have seen it, you have laser dub. Okay, so this is olive. Same exact item numbers, same exact color theoretically, but they're completely different in reality. So batch to batch, sometimes materials are just not consistent. And we all know feathers and furs are obviously not consistent because of natural fibers. But when you have something as uh, what you would think would be as easily replicable as a dubbing, even still, this is like a very light, almost like a yellowish olive. This is what I think of when I think of an actual olive. This is darker and they're just completely different colors, even though if you look at the package, they're both olive and they both have the exact same item numbers on them. So if you have a pattern and you're like, it's got to be that shade, maybe it doesn't. But if you're more confident, you want to make sure that you get the color that you're actually expecting. So buying things in store whenever possible, I definitely um, am an advocate of. I also like tying larger quantities of flies for a couple of reasons. One, uh, we all know how commonly it is how common it is to lose flies. And so for multi-step flies, I think having a, a, a prep station is important. You can buy these. You can also make them. Uh, I made this one out of um, molding. It's like one inch square molding and then some five mil sheet foam from a, from a, a craft store. 
that I then glued to the molding. And then I just cut strips out, little Vs. And then I, you know, so basically I can take this and uh, as I prep materials on hooks, I can just tuck them in there and have them all just stationed. For easy flies, like what I did tonight, two or three materials, you don't necessarily need a prep station. But if you're tying streamers, you know, like here's a streamer that I tie a lot. This is my little brown fish. This is a little goby imitation that I love. I've caught it like a countless fish on this fly. And I've, a lot of people have done the exact same thing. This is a fly that I tie in multiple steps. So I put my lead on first, you know, this is, this is 15 wraps, a 0.25 lead. And I do just that on a dozen hooks or two dozen hooks at a time, right? That's all I do. I get the exact amount of lead wraps on this hook. And that's it, I do it on all of them. And then I go and I'll, and I'll tie on the tail and the body and the fins and that's it. I tie that on every single one. And then I come back and then I add the bunny strip and the, um, the eye. When I buy these, these, uh, these fish skulls, I go through and I install every single eye onto them right out of the box. And that way, when I go to tie with them, they're all done. I don't have to futz with it as I'm, as I'm tying. And so that's a couple things. One, it is more efficient time-wise. I know not everybody's a commercial tire. And I'm not advocating you to do that because it's like arguably not worth it. Um, but even if you're not, if you're going to tie a dozen flies, two dozen flies for a trip or just for whatever, having some extra, you end up with more consistent results when you're focusing on that one task. You're not doing one fly at a time. You're focusing on just the lead, then just the bodies, and then just the rabbit, and then just the head in the case of this fly. It's kind of like, um, what would be a good analogy? It's like you do laundry. And then you fold a shirt and you put the shirt in your dresser. And then you go back and you fold another shirt and then you put the shirt in your dresser. It's like doing that for every single piece of laundry. It's not efficient at all. So if you're going to tie a bunch of flies, you can just prep them, keep them all at the same pace. And then what you'll find, especially over time, is your consistency really increases. And you're also going to make a more durable fly because you're really focusing more on each of those each of those parts, not just like getting through this one, you're getting through just that part of it and you're gonna do a better job at each step along the way. So being able to take this fly and then as I go along through it, I can just tuck it into that, that station, um, awesome. And then I can just work from one end to the other. And then when I'm done, I can go back and do the next step and work my way down through. And it's very easy, you're not having flies sitting every which way. You can see where you're at and you can see what's left. So to consider you don't have to but if you're like me and you're kind of goofy you can make weird little brook trout scribbles on it if you feel so inclined um and so uh yeah i think uh when you take into consideration um so when you take into consideration just a few key points um, are you paying attention to the thread that you have? Is it really the best thread for the, the, the fly that you're tying? Are you trying to just minimize the bulk as much as possible? Usually you want to do that. Not always, but usually you want to. Uh, are you really paying attention to how you're prepping the materials as you're tying, before you're tying, and then as you're tying it? And then is there something you can do to make it more efficient, right? Because we're all doing it because we enjoy it, but then at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you have full boxes of flies that you can look at and feel really confident fishing. Um, so I hope that you were able to pick up a few things from that. Um, and I would love to answer questions. I know it's 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 been an hour and uh, three quarters, uh, so it's been a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be, to be totally honest. But we can take another five, 10 minutes if anybody had further questions. If there was like some nagging thing that kind of gets to you um, that you're wondering, maybe what's, is there a solution to that? Maybe I can answer it for you. Feel free to either throw in the chat or unmute yourselves. There you go. In the chat or unmute yourself. Either way is fine. Kirk looks like you. Kirk, do you have a question for me? Or do you have a thought that you want to share? No. Um, uh, so I'm out here on the deck. Uh, on the patio heat. I, I know the pair to go and means pellet. I was being a little bit uh, tongue in cheek there. <laughs> but thank you for. I thought for that was really funny dog, dog food. 
Kirk, no, no. Oh, we can't hear him for some reason. Huh. Sorry, not, Kirk, we can't hear you. Yeah, I don't uh -oh. know what the scenario is. You can, um, well, you know that you can put it in the chat. More than anybody knows. Yeah, that. I'll do that. Um, I see Bob asked about fishing one of the flies either yeah, individually. I'm not, I'm as, that one. I'm not sure which one you're asking. About. As, yeah, I, um, Bob, I, I, if any or all of them, I think. Yeah, any or all of them. The wet flies, I definitely fish. I just swing those individually. Um, I do fish them uh, under a dropper periodically. A lot of times I'll do like a caddis with a wet fly dropper. I fish that quite a bit. Um, the jig nymphs, typically, I'm either going to fish those individually, uh, usually. Um, occasionally, I would fish those with a heavier point fly. So in a multi-fly rig, the point fly is a lower fly. And those really small 16 or 18 jig nymphs, those are going to go higher up. So I might have anywhere from like two feet to four feet of tippet with my point fly, my heavier fly in the bottom. And then usually what I do is just like a above the knot to the tippet, I'll tie like a Davy knot with just like a six or eight inch length dropper, uh, you know, five, six, seven X, whatever I might be fishing. And then I'll tie that small little uh, jig to that. You could do it with wet fly too. Um, I, I don't always fish multi-fly rigs. A lot of times I'm fishing individually simply because it's, 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 <laughs> um, it's easier to goof when you have multiple hooks on in many different ways, whether you're like getting it hung up, um, as you're walking or you, you know, sometimes, I don't know, I've had it happen where I, I'm fighting a fish and then a fish comes and grabs another fly and then it, they both pull out. So I like, I like individual flies more commonly than multi-fly rigs, but not always. Um, cool. I don't see any more questions. I don't hear any more questions. Uh, so I'm gonna interpret that if there's no more questions and we're right at uh, one hour, 45 minutes. Hopefully you're able to find something of use from this talk. Um, as always, if you have questions that you forgot to ask or for whatever, for whatever reason they didn't come up tonight, feel free to reach out to me. I feel like, I don't know, practically anybody on here probably knows how to reach me. Um, and if you don't, somebody in the chapter definitely does. So Josh and Michael and Don definitely know. So um, I don't know if I can end this because I'm not a, <laughs> it's not my Zoom. But thanks everybody for joining me tonight. And uh, I had a great time. Um, so thank you all. Chat soon. Have a good night. Bye.